So what is on my heart and what shall we pray as we gather? Well, Ephesians 3 verse 18 is one of the Apostle Paul's great prayers. Ephesians 3 verse 18. But it is strange to many ears. So chapter 3, Paul kneels, verse 14, kneels before the Father. And he prays, verse 16, for strengthening power from the God of glorious riches, power to strengthen us through his Spirit in our inner beings. We need God's power. We need God's help so much after the last 18 months. But power to do what? Verse 18, I pray that you may have power together with the Lord's people, all the Lord's holy people in London, in Seoul, in Jerusalem, in Nairobi, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. There's the prayer. Pray for God's power that he would make us strong enough to grasp how huge is the love of Christ. God loves his church and we need his help to be strong enough to understand it. Is that, is that a strange prayer? Here is the urgent prayer of Paul for the church in Ephesus that all the supernatural power of God would be at work inside them so that they could begin to grasp how much God loves them, which fits Ephesus and London and perhaps all of us all over the world after the last 18 months. Big church or small church, we are surrounded by institutions that look bigger and more important. In Ephesus, it was the rulers and authorities. It was the temple of the goddess Artemis. It was all the networks of family and trade and society. For us in London, it is the scorn of secular society. It is the pain of scandals and doubt in the church. It is the way everyone agreed you can close churches for COVID because they are not important. And I've I heard little bits of the restrictions that you currently face, uh, restrictions on numbers at church meetings, and I'm sure there are, there are any number of other battles, the battles of caring for each other and holding out the gospel while a, a global pandemic closes down all our usual ways of meeting. But we should pray that God's rich power would work inside us so that we could know that he loves us. And I, I want to show us how Paul answers his own prayer and then the difference it could make to us. So first, his answer. When Paul prays this, uh, he prays they would understand God's love. He's really praying that they would understand his own letter, or at least Ephesians chapter 2. See, Paul is trying to answer his own prayer by writing Ephesians chapter 2. How do you know God loves the church? Well, look at what he has done to create her. Chapter two, he started with the dead. Those dead in our sins, two verse one. Those deserving of his wrath, his anger. But, two verse four, because of his great love, the dead are made alive and raised and saved. Then look at two verse 11. He started with the separate, excluded from Israel, without hope and without God. But he is our peace. He brought us near by the blood of Christ, near to God and near to each other. Thousands of miles apart with different history and culture and language, but brought near to God, 2 verse 18, access to the Father, by one spirit, because that is where we meet each other. 2 verse 19, no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. So I have more in common with you, who I have never met, than I do with members of my own family here in England, because you and I, we meet in the presence of the God 
who brought both of us near to him. And 2 verse 15 tells us what he is building in his love. It says, Christ, he set aside in his flesh the law and his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity or literally one new man out of the two. This is what he did with Jew and Gentile in Ephesus. This is what he is doing across the world and through time. Just one person now, Jesus Christ, and in him we are all one. If you understand that, then you understand the great love he has for us. It's been hard, hasn't it, during COVID to see so much that we used to do for God closed down, so many of the ways we used to make ourselves feel significant locally. But that shows us that we were looking in fragile places for our sense of significance. Let me tell you, in my first month here at All Souls, I went to see a new dentist just down the road from where I'm standing now. It was one of my worst visits to a dentist in my whole life. She asked for an hour, but two hours in, she hadn't even begun repairing the tooth. It was three hours in the end, three hours of um, your knee on the chair, full strength, pushing and pulling at my mouth, and three hours of pain. But that wasn't the worst thing that happened. Early in the visit, while I could still speak, she asked where I worked. And I said I was the pastor of the church at the top of Regent Street. And she, she thought for a second, I thought maybe she'd know it, maybe she'd even been. But she said, oh, is that the closed one? The closed one. And I thought, no! <gasps> yeah, but you don't like to disagree, do you, with a professional who is about to drill into your head? But you can see why. For 12 months... Our front doors had been shut every time she walked past. The lights were out. She doesn't see the Zoom Bible studies and the prayer meetings. She doesn't see the Sunday broadcast. It's just a closed, irrelevant church. Nothing significant going on there. But God disagrees. God loves the church. He loves what he is building. Do you know Ephesians 3 verse 10? Come back to chapter 3. I think it is the truth that sparks the prayer that we're talking about. 3 verse 10. God has an intent, an intent to manifest his wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. He wants to show them how wise he is. So all the heavenly rulers and authorities, imagine a, an enormous stadium, an enormous Olympic stadium filled with the heavenly rulers I assume he means demons as well as angels. God has something to show you that will really blow your mind. What would he show them, do you think? Stars and planets? Galaxies and black holes? Well, 3 verse 10, he shows them his greatest work. He shows them the church. Like globally, the church is a big deal. Some churches are a big deal locally, but Paul means the church in Ephesus. The, the feeling, the, the way we may be feeling after COVID, they feel it. Small and hidden and overlooked and laughed at and weak. And Paul tells them that when God really wants to show how great he is, he says to the heavenly host, come with me to Ephesus halfway up the hill in a tiny little meeting room and you'll see just a few of them gathered, a Jewish man and a Gentile woman who would not have been even willing to eat together two years ago. Look at them. Isn't God great? Dead sinners, scattered and separate, brought to life and made into one new humanity. Isn't God great? Are you surprised? God loves us so much, he's done this. And he thinks it's so good what he's done. He wants to show it off. Okay, so last thought. What difference would it make? What difference would it make if we grasped how much God loves us, if God answers the prayer in us? Well, Paul thinks it will change everything. 
everything that he talks about in chapters four to six. Certainly it's how we speak and think and love and marry and work and pray and evangelize. He, he thinks this will help us with anger and pride and slander and drinking and stealing. It's everything, which makes sense, doesn't it? If God answered the prayer and gave us the power to grasp how much he loves us, how much the creator of the world overflows with love when he thinks of the church. Wouldn't that change us? And when you lay out the pieces of chapter two and think about what God has done, it reminds me of a, a famous story. I think you may be surprised when I tell you which one. It's a, a much misunderstood and misused story. It's in a, a hundred films as horror or as comedy. It's in a hundred kids' TV shows as a joke. But it was a serious, thoughtful, interesting book originally when it was written in 1818. A book called Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. It's the, the story of a scientist who created life. Dr. Victor Frankenstein, he took the scattered pieces of the dead and tried to create a living giant of superhuman strength and beauty. That was his aim. And that's how we started, isn't it? Dead in sin and scattered. And God has made us into his worldwide global church and brought us to life. And in the story, Frankenstein builds his giant and he brings it to life. But he hates it. And he runs away. The scientist runs away. He abandons his creation and the, the giant, the monster, hides in a forest, confused about life, with only a set of clothes that he found in his creator's room. Until he learns to talk and then to read. And once he can read, he reads some papers that he found in the pocket of the coat. And he reads Dr. Victor Frankenstein's journal. He reads about how much his creator hated him. Here's what he says that reading it did to him. The monster says, it was your journal of the four months that preceded my creation. You minutely described in these papers every step you took in the progress of your work, the minutest description of my odious and loathsome person is given in language which painted your own horrors and rendered mine indelible. I sickened as I read, a cursed creator. Why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? Which is why it's a horror story. Can you see how it would hurt you to realize that your creator hated you. So in the book, the monster turns to hate and revenge and murder. Well, Ephesians, Ephesians 1 to 3, is like finding the journal of our creator in our pocket. We are God's superhuman giant. We are beautiful and alive. We are what he will show off for unending time. And God's word is the journal of his thoughts about us. So imagine what we would say to our creator. You minutely described in these papers every step you took in the progress of your work. Choosing, adopting, redeeming. You sealed and raised and seated and united. These minutest description of our holy and blameless person is given in language which painted your own delights and rendered ours inexhaustible. What would we say? I blossomed as I read. Blessed creator, why? Why did you form a marvel so wonderful that you turned to us in love that surpasses knowledge? Which is why the gospel is a love story not a horror story. It's why we need to pray that he would help us understand how much he loves us. Do you see how it would transform us to realize that our creator loves us this much? So we pray. 
Ephesians 3, verse 18, we pray that God would make us strong enough to know, even in part, how much he loves us. Amen.